Iowa putting on a great show in game number one, and then UConn and Southern Cal, the game that was kind of flying under the radar but ended up being just as entertaining in the nightcap. And now we have our final four set for women's basketball coming up this weekend in Cleveland. Yeah, that, that was fun, guys. And um, we got the Paige, Paige Becker's revenge tour as well. <clears throat> I mean, she she she's fun to watch too, man. I mean, she uh, obviously was the number one player coming out a few years ago and then has had injuries and just I feel like fell off the radar a little bit because of, you know, obviously what Caitlin Clark was doing, what South Carolina was doing, what LSU was doing, and – she uh she's special too man it, this has been this has been really cool to see all the different players that, that have kind of led their teams and, and i'll be honest when i was kind of looking at at this cluster of programs that I, I thought had a shot to win it southern cal was one of the ones that i i was kind of maybe you'd say concerned about from, from like a gamecock perspective and so so iowa knocks them out or excuse me um yukon knocks them out and I, uh, I I don't know. I, I think this kind of sets up pretty well for South Carolina, all things considered. You, you're obviously you're gonna have to beat great teams to to win it, but I, I think it sets up pretty well. And you know, if I'm the NCAA, if I'm ESPN, I feel great about all this because you got you got storylines galore. You've got an underdog in, in NC State a little bit. You got UConn who. Um, you know, was having a down year by their standards, but has has put it together at the right time. And then, of course, you have the potential, the potential for Iowa and South Carolina in a rematch, but for all the marbles. Give, give me y'all's early pick, very early pick between Iowa and UConn. Do we have Iowa? Uh, yes, but that's not a competent yes at this point in time. I think it's going to be a very I, tight game. I actually, so we'll go back, full disclosure, I actually picked Southern Cal to make the title game against okay. South Carolina, uh, USC battle. Um, I actually picked Iowa to get upset earlier in the tournament by Colorado. That did not obviously come to fruition. Uh, West Virginia probably played Iowa the toughest, or they mm -hmm. did play Iowa the toughest. They did a pretty good job, especially defensively. God, but, if they could have shot, then... They would have won. Yeah, that, it would have that, been very that was, different. That was their undoing. But I mean, I mean, you got to give. I mean, Iowa give them a ton of. They play very well. Caitlin Clark had you know another generational type of performance. She was incredible. To your point, Wes Becker. She's definitely like UConn as a team is flying under the radar. Beckers is flying under the radar. Not only has she come back from that knee injury and been really, really good, she's also playing out of position. Mm -hmm. She's playing the four all year, so she's guarding in the post. She's still stepping out, hitting threes. She's grabbing boards. I mean, she's she's been extremely impressive as well. Obviously, a lot of the headlines going in this past weekend revolved around the matchup between LSU and Iowa. Of course, rematch of last year's national championship game. It, it is kind of weird to say that UConn's been flying under the radar. And again, this is a program that Gina REM has taken to countless Final Fours, won a ton of national championships. They are perennially one of the best programs in the country. Um, last year was obviously a down year. They dealt with a lot of injuries. They've had a lot of injuries this year as well. I mean, Beckers never left the court last night because they really didn't have much depth outside of their starting five. But, you know, now here they are once again. Again, in the Final Four, getting a chance to take on Iowa. And, you know, we talk about how big of a matchup LSU and Iowa was last night. I think UConn and Iowa is just as big, if not bigger, when you talk about the star potential or the star power between Paige Beckers and Caitlin Clark on opposing sides. Well, th this thing's going to be deemed, I mean, we're, it's on ESPN right now. We're looking at it. It's going to be deemed Beckers versus Clark. And, it, you know, fair. And that's from a, from a headline standpoint, from a rating standpoint, that's probably what, what you should do. Um, however, I, I do think the supporting cast will be just as important in terms of which supporting cast can kind of pick up their superstar and, and outplay the other supporting cast. This is a this is not your your typical UConn championship team. I, I mean, they they obviously have had injuries, but it, it's just it's kind of weird to see them basically playing five girls. Like that, that's kind of um, what, what they do. This is not a deep lineup. That they're going to put their starting five out there, and as long as there's not foul trouble, they're going to kind of they're going to kind of steal some minutes here and there. But for the most part, they're going to play their five. And you know, it, much like with Caitlin Clark, it's a little bit different structured, but it, it revolves around Paige Beckers. And 
I, I don't even know what you call what she's playing. I guess it's like a point forward. Like she's she's playing the four, but then she's handling the basketball on <laughs> offense, and she's um, you know throwing up threes and hitting them. She's playing down low. Uh, she's a good finisher at the rim. Like she, I mean, she can do a lot of different things. And so, you know, I, I think this will be a fascinating matchup. I'm glad we got to see Iowa LSU. That was one. You know, I think you, there are some matchups you could circle even when the bracket came out, and you were just hoping that maybe a team didn't get knocked off beforehand so that we get to see some of these. And, you know, UConn versus South Carolina w- would be fun, but we've seen that. I, I'm i really – personally, I'm hoping we get South Carolina-Iowa rematch for all the marbles. Yeah, I mean, that would be – that would be the most compelling matchup, I think, of anybody. That's what ESPN wants. I think that's why yeah. the brackets kind of worked out the way that they did. Tyler, the conspiracy theory. But, I mean, you, you, here's something that caught my eye. And, and if you look over the box scores of both the UConn Southern Cal game and then Iowa LSU, like, there are multiple players in both of those games that didn't come off the floor. And so you, you got to kind of wonder, you know, we talk all the time about South Carolina's depth. Is that going to help them not only get NC State, but if they can advance? And will it catch up to either Iowa or UConn in that game? You know, you look at, at UConn, they've been decimated by injuries this year. They played seven girls during the game. Three players went the distance. Aliyah Edwards, Paige Beckers, Nika Mule. The three, be- three best players, really. They they played 40 minutes in that game. You look at the Iowa game, you know, Anissa Morrow for LSU played the entire game, but Iowa, they played Gabby Marshall and Caitlin Clark 40 minutes, and Kate Martin played 39 minutes. You know, then on the other hand, you got South Carolina where they played nine players, and two of their bench players had over 20 minutes. You know, so they can rotate a lot more. That The pace in the LSU uh, Iowa game was breakneck at times. You know, very fast game. A lot of mistakes being made in that game. A lot of until big the shots. final two minutes. Until the final yeah. two minutes, and it took an hour. You know, but um, g- great, great games, entertaining games, and I think we're you know there's more in store with the next the next three games in this tournament. And I think that depth is even more beneficial in that second game when you're talking about like a Final Four weekend where, okay, I win and you kind of obviously have to play each other on Friday night. Winner of that goes to the national championship. And let's say South Carolina does get past North Carolina State on Friday to punch their ticket to play Iowa or UConn, whoever it may be, where you played, okay, now you're playing a second game within less than 48 hours of the other game. That's where it really comes into where, okay, South Carolina, especially in the second half of that game, theoretically, that bench is going to benefit them a lot more because, again, they're not having, you know, Beckers or Clark or whoever it may be you know having out been out there for 40 minutes on friday night yeah and i I think you know not not that there are many cons to having depth but that that does put a little bit of the onus on don staley and the staff and their decision making within a game as well and so if you know if you know who your five are you're just rolling them out there and you're living or dying with what happens (laughs) and with, with south carolina there very much is kind of that decision-making process. What matchup do we love? Who's hot today? Who's not? Who has maybe missed some shots, but we just feel like it's it's going to – this is our person. We're going to stick with them. You know, if, if Paige Beckers misses seven straight shots, she ain't coming out of the game. <laughs> right. You're just rolling her back. You're going to count on she's going to get it right. With South Carolina, there is – you almost have – you have multiple decisions in how you can play it because you have so many different options. And I kind of thought, I thought last year, not that we should get ahead of ourselves because that NC State team. Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. NC State is sitting there like, oh, y'all can talk about South Carolina, UConn, Iowa. We're here too. And you know they're going to be playing underdog. You want to talk about flying under the radar. <laughs> I mean, NC State's barely on the graphic up here, I think. Like, I, I don't think anybody at all is talking about them for the most part. So, if you're South Carolina, you cannot look ahead. But, you know, I, I do think – I think depth is, is – great. South Carolina is by far, of the four teams, the most complete, deepest team that is left. But 
the problem we saw against Iowa last year is that on any given night, if you're going up against the best player on the floor, only, only five can play at once. And I think South Carolina, it felt like watching the game. And I was thinking this myself. Oh, South Carolina is eventually going to just wear Iowa down. And they kind of played their game last year, which is a very different game than what they play this year. Right. Um, we'll see. If it gets there, big if, if it gets there, I'm curious to see what the the new South Carolina style, this year's style, what that will look like uh, against Iowa. But, but first, you got you to gotta take care of an don't, NC State team yeah, that has a couple of superstars of their own right. Don't disrespect the pack. Yeah, it's very, it's so like juicy to think about what's next, you know, especially if it's Iowa that the rematch, everything. I mean, there's no like that's what everybody wants to see. If you're not an NC State or UConn fan, that's what you want to see. But I mean, you're gonna have to get past an NC State team if you're South Carolina. I mean, look who they've beaten. They beat a Tennessee team. Kelly Harper got dismissed. That's kind of tough, right? Made made what four tournaments, two Sweet Sixteens. And yeah. Not good enough. Was yeah. a shot away. Didn't make it past the Sweet 16. Though. Didn't make it past, which is, is Tennessee. Yeah, they, they have a but, high standard. But but a good, that's a good team. Yep. Right? Gave South Carolina all they could handle, not once, not tw- three times, really. Beat them. Beat a Stanford team that many people had as a Final Four pick mm-hmm. uh, by 10. And beat number one seed Texas by 11. So, like you said, ex- extremely capable team. And... That's the I I know Dawn Staley's really good at managing her team. We know that. That's one of her I think best qualities among many. But that's going to be something that I'm sure she's thinking about. Let's make sure we don't look past NC State, you know, mentally, physically. Yeah, absolutely. And I they'll be locked in come Friday night. Should be an exciting game. That game will tip off at seven o'clock. You'll be able to listen to it right here on the game at uh, six thirty. By the way. I, I got to say this, and this is probably because of the the men's NC State team, what they're doing as well. But um, there there are more NC State fans in Columbia than I than I ever knew existed. I was walking around Soda City on Saturday, saw some some wrinkled shirts that had come out of the closet. I think so. <laughs> you, you guys, <laughs> you guys been, are out there. Hadn't been broken out since the Valvano years, I guess. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're here. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's not uh, Raleigh's not that far away, I guess. Um, but yeah, big weekend for NC State, both uh, men and women in action in the uh, in the Final Four. I also want to let you know, coming up on Thursday night, have Carolina calls with Coach Kingston, six o'clock right here on the game. This baseball will be in action this weekend, taking on Texas A and M. We'll continue the conversation about women's basketball, including one of South Carolina's key stars. Moving on to the WMDA after this weekend. With that coming up, it's Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs here on The Game. All right, before we get back to sports, going to tell you about one of our great sponsors here. It's our friends at Classic Roofing. One of the most important parts of your home is, of course, your roof. You want to make sure your roof is taken care of. And my friends Joe Reeder and Max Sawyer, they want to do just that. Give them a call today, 803-590-7870, or head on over to ClassicRoofingSC.com. You can get more information about their background, their services, and most importantly, you can set up a free estimate. They're going to do what they did for me and my wife. They're going to come out. They're going to inspect your roof. They're going to climb up there. They're going to get the drone out. They actually let me fly it. Thing was pretty cool. High-tech drone, HD cameras. They're going to check out everything about your roof, and then they're going to let you know, hey, this thing's got a long shelf life left. This thing's got a short life left. Or, hey, here are a couple of little things we can do to extend that life. You want to take care of your roof, and they want to help you do it. 803-590-7870, classicroofingsc.com.
Welcome back in. Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler Head, West Mitchell, Chris Clark with you on this Tuesday. Can talk on all things women's basketball as the Gamecocks will be in action against the Wolfpack on Friday night. 7 o'clock tip, 6.30 pregame right here on the game. Baseball on Friday night will be on our sister station, ESPN 1320 WISW pregame at 6.45. 7 o'clock first pitch at Founders Park against Texas A&M. Uh, some news coming up yesterday afternoon in regards to Gamecock women's basketball. No surprise here, Camille Cardoso officially announced that she will be entering the WNBA draft, which is coming up in right at two weeks' time um, after the uh, Final Four this upcoming weekend. Again, we kind of saw this coming. Obviously, it's had a phenomenal season here at South Carolina in her first as a starter and uh, is projected to go pretty high uh, be in the top five somewhere in the WNBA draft here in a couple of weeks yeah isn't, isn't it four or five something like that it, yeah that kind of it's the, kind of depending uh, on which mock draft you look yeah, at the, yeah the thought process and um I, I mean you, you just don't see six seven girls who can run the the floor the way she can um incredibly athletic for her size man so uh, obviously a, a team that that has that need is going to draft her very highly and um you know i think she'll have a, a long professional career if she wants it and so uh yeah you know she was one of those she technically had another year if she wanted it and i, I think probably just wanted to go ahead and get the announcement out of the way now she won't be asked about it in the locker room at all leading in or after the NC State game or anything like that. Now it's just out there. You can focus on. You have hope. Hopefully, two games left of your career. It's, I, I'm having a hard time not looking ahead to various things today, like the South Carolina Iowa potential <laughs> rematch. I'm I'm, tr- I'm trying. I'm trying. But I even look ahead. Like you about to go next year on us? Yeah, I'm about <laughs> to go next year because just because. Listen, you talked. You actually hit on it earlier, and it got the wheels turning. So the difference in the South Carolina team that played Iowa last year and the difference in the South Carolina team that we've seen go undefeated throughout this regular season and so far in the postseason, like pretty drastic, you know, Um, in terms of the personalities, the the skill sets, the play style. Last year it was very much you had a dominant post player in Aaliyah Boston. You're playing defense. You're scoring the ball inside. This year you're a more well-rounded team. You'd like to run a little bit more. You're younger, you're more versatile, I think, and you, but you've still had a, a presence inside in Cardoso that can be dominant in spurts or even throughout a whole game, and she runs the floor well, yes, but she can block shots, so she gives you so much defensively, and at the end of the day, when it's like we need a bucket, you can get it to Cardoso, and she's generally going to make something happen, so without that, it's not like you're, you know, the cupboard's empty, right? You've got Sanaya Fagan, who's very talented. You've got Ashlyn Watkins. You've got Joyce Edwards coming in. But I'm just kind of fascinated. Okay, you know you got Pow Pow coming back. You've got you've still got plenty of post talent. But what is the the style of this team? And does Dawn Staley look to the portal for a piece? If so, mm-hmm. like what is that piece? Is it more along the lines of shooting, or is it a post player? I just I find myself fascinated by that. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think, you know, I think Cardoso is the perfect example of what this South Carolina program can be for an individual player. Of course, she started her career at Syracuse a couple years ago. That's where she had made her prior three point shot before that Tennessee game a couple <laughs> weeks back. Um, but but she comes in here, she, you know, she she's plays in her first two years, but is not a, a featured starter. Waits her turn. Obviously, the freshie class moves on after last year, gets featured in that prominent role this year and has just been phenomenal from point A to, uh, to point B coming up here on the end of the season. And now is getting the opportunity to go very high in the WNBA draft. And we talk about, you know, not not a lot of girls transferring out of South Carolina. And I think that's a shining example of why that if you wait your turn, even if it's only for one year, you're going to get your opportunity to show, uh, to show out and have that opportunity to, uh, you know, translate your game to the next level as well. Well, and, and you can make an impact off the bench at, at South Carolina as well. Like, I, I think this is her first year as a starter, but I would almost say she was a co-starter last year, even if she wasn't technically starting. You know, she played a ton. I, I thought... I really thought Cardoso was kind of South Carolina's X factor last year. Like they would bring her off the bench. She would make an immediate impact. She could play the game, maybe not quite worrying about, um, you know, I, I'm not going to foul out because I, I know my minutes are going to be a little a little bit limited, so I can just go completely hard the entire time. And I, I think the thing that has made her a perfect match with this year's team 
is her ability to pass the basketball. Like, I mean, she whips that thing around, and she she makes quick decisions a lot of times on that. She gets the ball back out to the perimeter with a quickness, and, you know, she uses her size with that kind of overhead pass. And, you know, I, I think that, that's been a, a big difference maker. Not only do you have, obviously, the, the girls who can shoot the ball from the outside, but you, you have a passer from the inside. So e- even though, and the interesting thing going into next year, I think, even though this is much more of a balanced team, a team that can shoot the three ball, to me, they're still at their best when they're an inside out team. You know, they're getting they're working the ball inside and then letting her make a decision. Am I am I gonna go to the basket or am I gonna kick the ball back out? And sometimes there's a little back and forth, you know, a couple of times within a possession. To me, that's when South Carolina they're at their best in the half court in those scenarios and of course they're at their best when they're just running the floor and kind of speeding things up but do do you see what we saw you know when Cardoso has missed some this year um you know is it Watkins and Kitts on the floor at the same time is it Fagan and one of them on the floor at the same time or like Chris said do you go to the I think if you go to the portal it's because there's a center out there Mm -hmm. a true five who is a perfect match. Yeah. I don't know that you're you're not gonna kinda upset things if there's not somebody that just makes complete and total sense. Because you know, we saw they they recruited Anisa Morrow out of the portal this past season. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh she she goes to tell us you obviously South Carolina then um you know they went and got Sakima Walker, but she hasn't played as much as, as obviously the other girls who are in the post. So uh, could could they go that rec- direction, portal? Yes. Could they just kind of stick with what they have, knowing that you're bringing in the number two player in the country as well? You know, I, I think that's that's a potential path, too. And, and I think what you said about Cardoso and her ability to, to pass out of the post and, look, another difference in this year's team, the ability to punish teams for that. I mean, that, that was very uh, well illustrated when Raven Johnson made her big shot, right, in, in the uh, Indiana game, I mean, you get it to Cardoso, they basically double her, they're about to double her. She very quickly passed it out to Raven Johnson, who last year, maybe she doesn't shoot that ball. Maybe she looks to pass it, maybe she looks to feed the post again. This year, she's shooting it with confidence. They talked about out on the broadcast a lot how much she shot, you know, uh, in the off season, and it has improved her confidence, has improved her actual shot. You've got her, you've got Pow Pow, you've got Bree Hall, you've got several people who can shoot the three on this team, and that that's been a huge difference for them. And you know, honestly, that's probably a direction that you want to you want to keep that going for the future because you've seen how it can benefit you. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so again, this weekend, hopefully for two more games, we'll get to see Camille Cardoso in a Gamecock uniform before moving on to the WNBA, which it, it, it's so crazy that the quick turnaround as opposed to other sports where you go straight from the end of one season right into the draft two weeks later and then what the WNBA season starts is it mid-May it's pretty soon after that it's kind of a funky calendar compared to some of the other sports yeah that's kind of strange you're, you're playing and you know I guess Major League Baseball don't they sometimes go ahead and put guys in the minors to an extent but but I mean for the WNBA you're you're on the court like potentially yeah. right away which is a long year for for everybody. For sure. Um, but, yeah, Camille Cardoso going to get her name called very, very early. And, again, hopefully can uh, walk out of South Carolina with another national championship ring this upcoming weekend. Jump into some spring football conversation as uh, practice number six took place this morning. Again, we'll hear from Coach Beamer and right at an hour get his thoughts on it. We'll dive into that conversation coming up. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs here on The Game. Got a great recommendation for y'all 
to maximize your enjoyment of all the outstanding sports action that we've been talking about here on the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour on the game. That is our friends at Integrated Media, Michael and Nathan and their entire team. They've been to my home. They've been to West Mitchell's home. They can come out to yours. What can they do for you? They can do anything from an audiovisual standpoint that you may need, whether it's strengthening your internet signal so that you don't have any dead spots in or around your home for streaming, whether you want a new TV setup, whether you want to trick out an entire man cave or go for a complete smart home system, they can do it for you. IntegratedMediaInc.com is where you can go to learn more. If you want to check out some examples of their past work, some photo galleries, if you're looking for a little inspiration, Integrated Media Columbia on Facebook and on Instagram. they got some really cool photos of some of their past projects. 803-948-8327 is where you can go. Give Michael and Nathan a call today. IntegratedMediaInc.com. Welcome back in Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler Head, West Mitchell, Chris Clark along with you on this Tuesday morning. Quick reminder for you, uh, again, coming up on Friday, you can golf with the game out at Charwood Golf Club in West Columbia for our annual spring golf tournament. Uh, if you want to take part, it's $400 for a foursome, $200 for a pair. 
going to be a 10 a.m. shotgun start. Going to be giving away USC baseball tickets, Carowind tickets, concert tickets, craft beer passports, so much more. Uh, still have time. If you want to take part, give Charlotte a call at 803-755-2000. Register again, 803-755-2000. If you want to take part this upcoming Friday at a Charlotte Golf Club in West Columbia. A little under an hour from now, and we'll have it for you right here on the game as we do on Tuesdays during the spring. Coach Beamer talking to the media as spring practice rolls along. Practice number six was in the books a little bit earlier on this morning. You know, last weekend, or last week, I guess, um, in his Tuesday presser, I think that was the shortest Beamer ever talked. He only went like mm-hmm. 20 minutes. Terry and I were pretty surprised by it, but, you know, as we get deeper and deeper into spring, I, I feel like we still just kind of have the same questions that aren't really going to get answered at this point in time about where this team is and who's going to be sliding into what roles until we actually see legitimate competition. Yeah, and, you know, we, we've talked about the cornerback competition. That that kind of has emerged to me as one of the more intriguing position battles that you're going to see. Quarterback battle, it, it doesn't feel like they want to name, you know, like a starter anytime soon. You get that impression too, Chris. Like I, I don't. I, I think yeah. they're gonna kind of let them fight it out for a while. That that's what I've been. Yeah, Shane Beamer's not gonna. Here's my prediction. He's not gonna come to the podium today and say Lenore Sellers Lenore is a starting Sellers quarterback. Is, yeah, we actually decided just this morning. We met as a staff. Yeah, I, I'm starter. I'm with you. Yeah. I, it seems like they're gonna let that. You, you kind of have to, especially you you bring in somebody from the portal, and right. it, you didn't promise anything other than you promised the opportunity to compete. So you can't be like, all right, man, well, good good two weeks, good three weeks. Thanks for the two practices and pads yeah. that we've had. Yeah. So you, you got to let it play out, I think. And you want to keep those guys pushing each other. So that, that's a position battle, obviously, but we're not going to get final answers on that or, or cornerback at, at this point. Y- you know a spot that I – I would like to hear Beamer be asked about today would be the offensive line. And so when we had, and I'm talking maybe, and I don't know how much he'll give, but some specifics on the ongoing battles there and in terms of cross-training, who's going to play where within that O-line group. And, you know, Dal Loggins, when he talked to us at Pro Day, he you know, he went as far as to say, hey, th- this offense is going to go as far as this O-line can take it. And it, he was, he said it basically like, I mean, I know this, you guys know this, everybody knows this, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting that he he actually just came out and said it. And But I, I think it's a, it's a truism with uh, a lot of offenses. It's going to come down to your offensive line. But what we saw last year, and, and then I my follow-up was like, hey, do you feel like, you have developed that depth that you need there. And paraphrasing here, he basically was like, we're, we're trying to find those seven to eight guys that we trust. Like, basically, we're, we're not there yet. And this was a pre-spring interview, to be clear. But mm-hmm. um, it, it's still a work in progress. And I, I think it's going to be a work in progress in terms of who lines up where. Like, we, I, I thought we'd see Ja'Kai Moore at left guard he's been playing a ton of left tackle when, when we've been out there and so you know how, how can josiah thompson push there um tree babalade i believe has maybe just been a little dinged up a little banged up um you know he hasn't necessarily been out there with the ones when we've been out there um you know so i, I think there's still quite a bit to be determined can, can marky anderson who missed last year with an injury kind of get back to that pre-injury form and then continue his progress as now a second-year player. That was a guy, I mean, Chris, you remember, there there was some, like, some heavy praise. Strong words. For this kid last year. I dare say if everybody was healthy, he would have been one of the freshmen we were talking about playing last season. Instead, it obviously ended up being Tree and then Tro Ball inside at guard. And by the way, let, let's address the, the latest social media controversy. T- tree, apparently not transferring, Wes. He had a little... Tree messing with y'all, man. He had, he had a little fun on social. It's been real USC or whatever it was. It's been fun. See y'all later. Nope. Not going anywhere from what we're told. So, so that's good, obviously. But in seriousness, I mean, th- this, is, this is one of, I think, several positions, position groups where... You know, I think it was fair to come in the spring with 
like a like a healthier, more optimistic outlook than last season. But you still have some questions. You know, I I think whether it's like it's offensive line, it's edge, it, it's it's running back. Like on paper, I think you're better because you're already at a spot where, like you don't you don't know who the left tackle is going to be. It might be Jakai Moore, it might be somebody else, right? But you also feel like you've got more options. I think you you feel like you've got more quality across the board, whether it's just talent straight up or just even depth. I feel like you can get to, okay, here's a starting five that we feel pretty good about going into game one with maybe less questions. Again, you're in spring, so by the time you have spring, summer, preseason camp, it's time to go play Old Dominion. I think that internally – the staff will probably feel better about their five. They might have some questions, right? Mm -hmm. But you always have some level of questions, especially when you're breaking in some new guys. But I think they'll feel better about it than going into last year's UNC game, opponent not, notwithstanding. And I do feel like you can get to that 7-8 level of uh, just in terms of total guys. I feel like you can get there uh, in, a, in a better fashion as well on the O-line. How much stock do you put into – when we do these interviews and stuff, press conferences, this time of year, you know, you'll hear from offensive players, hear from defensive players. How much stock do you put into defensive player A shows some love to offensive player A who he's been battling with in practice? Like, I, I think um, I think Boogie, hopefully I'm not butchering this, I think Boogie showed some love to Torricelli Simpkins the third. Don't the third. miss that part. The third. Um, last week, and, and obviously you're talking about interior D lineman, interior O lineman, a center in Simpkins, a newcomer, and you know those two guys have, have probably had some battles in in eleven on eleven. They probably had some battles in kind of some one on one situations as well. And you know, for him to single him out, do, do you put? I, I mean, I kind of maybe put a little stock in it too. When you're talking yeah. about a guy like Boogie, who he's been around the block. He's a veteran now. He's seen opponents uh, or teammates who he's going up against in practice. He's seen them come and go, and, um, you know, he, he's seen a little bit of everything probably. So so maybe it does mean something. Yeah, I, I think what you do with it is is you do kind of file. You, you don't take it as, up, you know, starter now. You know, like you don't you don't mark that down. But I do think you, okay, well, you know, you listen to it. You take it under advisement, and, you know, you've got a, you got a ways to go, right? But Simpkins, especially when it's a guy – that maybe is flying under the radar a little bit more. You know, he he's not going to be as talked about as much as, like, the freshman class that came in with Thompson and Pringle and Franks. Uh, he may not even be talked about as much as, like, an A.J. Parks who came in, former four-star, you know, prospect because he came from North Carolina Central. He's not a 6'5 a guy. He's like a smaller guy. He's an interior lineman. That's not as flashy, not as sexy as a, as a left tackle, right? But I do think you pay attention to it and, and – probably start paying a little more attention when we're out there watching maybe talking to some people that we talk with you know about the offensive line well there, there's something to be said for Simpkins pretty much starting like every possible game he could yeah at his prior immediately. stop I mean immediately true freshman comes in you're being counted on to to be a center and and you know a lot of times you, you maybe have some call responsibilities there mm-hmm Rec or recruited and coached by said Williams, former Gamecock offensive lineman. And, you know, I, I think, dude, that that could be a sneaky, important pickup for South Carolina because, it, and, and to me, it, it Simpkins first on the depth chart at the end of spring, is he first on the depth chart, the beginning of the fall, the end of the preseason. I don't know if that necessarily matters. He He could be, but... I think he's one of those guys. We we all know you're going to have guys get dinged up on the O line. That is a fact of life, and that's why that's why you see coaches throw out that seven to eight number. And, and I think ideally, you want to have you want to have an option if your center. So I think this is what why a lot of times coaches say eight. You obviously have the five. You want to have an option if your center goes down. You want to have an option if a guard goes down. And you want to have an option if a tackle goes down. You don't necessarily have to have 10, but you want to have your five best and then three options past that. The problem for South Carolina last year is they were getting to option 9, 10, 11 
at times, and that's when I think you can really get hurt. I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, and options obviously being from a depth standpoint. How important is it to have a versatile guy like for Sean Lee, who you can ideally put at center, but be able to move to multiple spots and have a uh, have him play to that starter caliber level no matter if you have him at guard tackle or the center spot if you need to move him around yeah I think I think you have to have that but they they've got that with, with several guys I mean you, you look at Vershawn now he's one like you said truly could play center guard tackle that's fairly rare I feel like but you, you look at let's say Ja'Kai Moore like we talked about he's playing left tackle a lot right now but has played guard a ton in his career has also played tackle Tree has mainly played tackle to this point in the games in his career, but there's been talk he could play guard. Simpkins could play center or guard. Um, you know, Marquis Anderson played a little bit of tackle in practice last year, but I think is more of a guard center type. But they, they do have some versatility in this group, and, and that's something they, according to Beamer, they wanted to double down on this spring as well. And again, we'll hear from Beamer in about 45 minutes, 1230. We'll have that for you right here on the game. We'll come back and wrap up today's edition of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs coming up here on the game. All right, guys, looking for that special gift for a sports fan in your life who maybe is difficult to buy for. Look no further than our friends at Gold Line Framing in West Columbia. Owner Kendall Walsh, manager Johnny James, they're going to take outstanding care of you and any and all of your custom framing needs. That could be diplomas, original artwork, canvases, jerseys, flags. Maybe you've got a signed print that you want to throw on the man cave wall. They can have that framed up for you, too. And, again, maybe there's somebody in your life you want to get a, a great gift for. Uh, give them a call today, 803-739-1337. They've been in business for over 20 years. They're over at 511 12th Street. Again, that's in West Columbia. If you're looking for ideas, they also in-store have an art gallery, home decor, furniture, and gift items. If you're a South Carolina fan, they got you covered. If you're buying for a Clemson fan, they got you covered for that as well. I think they had those in the back, though. But uh, give them a call today if you got questions, 803-739-1337, or head on over to 511 12th Street, West Columbia.
Welcome back in Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler Head, West Mitchell, Chris Clark here wrapping up today's edition of the show. Talk plenty about women's basketball. I hadn't really talked about the men's. Of course, they settled on their final four this past weekend. And we'll continue to dive in those matchups as the week goes along. But I brought up a topic a little bit earlier because this weekend, of course, is the final four. It's also WrestleMania weekend up there in Philadelphia. So I thought of combining the best of both. And looking at the teams in the Final Four on the men's side, who are the heels and who are the faces? Mm. And for those that aren't familiar, heel is a common term for a bad guy in wrestling. Face is a common term for a good guy. Now that everybody is up to speed, I think unequivocally, North Carolina State is the ultimate baby face, right? Like everybody loves the story of North Carolina State, what they've been able to do. Everybody loves DJ Burns, the whole nine yards. And I think on the opposite end of the spectrum, like UConn's the ultimate heel, right? Well, I'd put Bama as a heel, too, personally. Yes. So that's an interesting question because from, like, a brand standpoint, given all their success in football and all that kind of stuff, yes. But basketball is more of a recent success thing. They've never made it to a Final Four until this year. I do think there's that element of, well, they just have everything, don't they? So people will hate them because of that. But I don't think Alabama basketball, outside of the SEC region itself, because we're obviously familiar and know what kind of pro- person Nate Oates is, I don't think they're as hated universally as maybe someone like UConn might be. Well, I think you said it, man. Nate Oates, it's just very hard for me to pull for that guy. He's like uh, not same. Pre- he's like Eric Bischoff. Like nobody likes him. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That's, a, likes that's a deep 90s that's a, that's cut deep, right there, deep man. Deep cut there. I do have a compare so, since you mentioned NC State. Okay. This just dawned on me. So, DJ Burns looks a little bit like Mark Henry. Yeah. Like, with the smile and everything. Mark Henry was a baby face and a heel at various times. Yes, he was. Uh, I so, thought he was better as a heel. Okay. Good analysis. But, uh, you know, I'll take – give me give me DJ Burns as a baby face right now. Oh, well, I, Except I, Duke I, fans. Percent. I don't know. But, I was going to say, outside of the Tobacco Road – baby face yeah. yes dj burns though is playing the edgy face role pretty well though like he you don't <laughs> see the video of him just yeah. like telling the duke fans like good night uh go home your season's over yeah i mean but it's kind of like stone cold you know he'd flip everybody off and then everybody would applaud it like he you know he he has some yeah some edgy face do, qualities do, do to any him. of the players uh if they win will they have somebody that some unknown person tossing them a drink like be, 50 yards that guy had that, a great arm that be, they, they say he should go into the hall of fame too for that <laughs> arm alone um maybe, maybe there's a maybe there's like a red bull nil sponsorship or something like you can't throw them cold beer but maybe yeah, you can well maybe you're throwing over, them sponsorship over 21 i don't see why not that's a that's one of the only rules left in in nil for is a it, lot of schools is it, e- is it even for a lot of schools for, I, think. I think it's a school rule yeah it's yeah. no uh, no alcohol i guess so um i couldn't figure out what to do with purdue because and they're perennially one of the better programs in college basketball obviously lost as a to a 16 seed in fairly dickinson last year zach Eady rubs people the wrong way a little He's bit a he was making the comments about oh people overlooked me bro you're seven foot four nobody overlooked you you went to, I, you went to img <laughs> academy nobody overlooked you um matt painter is kind of an inconspicuous head coach i don't think he really like you know gets on anybody's bad side necessarily but um i think them going up against nc state makes them the heel in that scenario because you just yes. have the great story of the plucky underdog team going up against you know the team that you expect to be there in purdue yeah i um i haven't put much thought into this obviously so but, but, yeah I, e- are, are we are we all pulling for nc state is that the, yes 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 everyone on the men's side on the men's yeah, yeah. gotta be gotta be careful yeah, about that go. yeah Good and job. none of us Good are pulling for NC State this. on the women's side. I, I only like 50% of this this weekend. <laughs> yeah, NC State, y'all can't have that much fun on campus this week. Like, you, you can get you can get one no, W. No, you, no, no double parades. You've made it long enough. Um, the real question is, can anyone beat UConn in the men's? Uh, I don't think so. 
Are they some, are they, you know, we talked about how the women's UConn team's flying under the radar. Is UConn still somehow flying no. under the radar? They're no. not? It, no, they're on top of the radar. Like they're they not are talked as in much. the middle of the radar. They haven't played any intriguing games in the tournament. They've because just, they're beating everybody by 20. Exactly. Going on 30 they, nothing they've, runs. They've laid waste to everyone. Like, the, game, <laughs> the game against Illinois this weekend was the least talked about game of the entire weekend in men's basketball. It's a snoozer. And they beat them by 30 points, went on that 30-0 run, because, again, they're there's not much to talk about. That's how the whole tournament's been for them. I just feel like they're not put in their context of, like, they, they won the title last year, they lost a bunch, and they're still destroying people. I just feel like like other teams, if they're that dominant, get talked about more. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe I, I'm missing something. I, I got to – this is going to be a stretch, but I'm going to do it anyway. This UConn run reminds me of the South Carolina baseball run. 2010 mm – -hmm. Well, South Carolina was a good team, good program, but nobody was really picking them to win the entire thing. And then they springboarded that into a dominant That's, run can, yeah. uh, the next year. And what, what did they win? 20 – how many straight postseason games did South Carolina baseball win? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was insane. In the, 20, the yeah. second – yeah, they were in some close games, but for the most part, I mean, that was a dominant postseason run. That's kind of what this reminds me of, obviously, different sport. I like that. Well, there you go. Heels and faces for the men's Final Four coming up this weekend. We're all cheering for NC State on the men's side. All right, coming up next is the halftime show with myself, no Terry Ford today. We'll dive more into women's basketball. Also talk some football as well with Shane Beamer's presser coming up at 1230. All right, here on the game. This has been the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs.